Uh, hello, and, and thank you so much for the invitation uh, to come visit with you. I know it's a beautiful evening outside, and I'm actually, I'm very honored that you've chosen to come spend a little bit of it with, with me, so, so thank you. Um, here's, here's my plan, what I'm thinking uh, for, for this presentation. I'm, I'm, I'm told that it's, it's customary to have, you know, like a lecture and then a, and then a discussion. Um, I don't like the word lecture because it implies that I'm, you know, I'm up here bestowing some wisdom upon you and you are, you're gratefully receiving this wisdom. That's, that's not what's happening here. Um, I hope we can have a conversation uh, and tell some stories and I'll tell some stories about uh, things that have worked for us and, uh, and we can see if they're, they're useful for you. So uh, as far as my plan, what I'm thinking, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about um, my organization, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and the organization I work for, how we work. And then I want to talk for a little bit about why I think it's so important that citizens, everyday people, play, uh, play a role in enforcing our environmental and health laws. Um, then I can give you a little bit of a, a little bit of background of some of the things in the American legal structure that uh, you know that are the uh, how how we operate, and then we can uh, I can tell some stories about uh, cases I've I've worked on, and um, if I if I you know I know people are here with different backgrounds and different education. If there's something I'm saying that you don't follow, please just say hmm? uh, what was that. And, and I can explain uh, better. Does that sound, does that sound okay? Okay, um, so uh, I'm an attorney. Uh, when I got out of college, my, my first job was as a wilderness teacher. Uh, you know, I was taking children, uh, actually kids in the prison system, in, in like outward bound kind of uh, nature programs. And that's when I really first started caring about the environment. And I went to go work for uh, Greenpeace and Rainforest Action Network as an activist. Um, and I, I, I really liked that work. I was very passionate about it. But, you know, I was standing there with my sign, you know, <laughs> against, the, against the company. And I said, you know what, I really want to sue these guys. And I want to stand out here with my sign. I want to sue them. So I went to uh, law school. Um, and uh, I graduated 25 years ago, which now makes, makes me feel a little old. Uh, and I've been doing the same thing this whole time, um, working to try to use a legal degree to do environmental protection, whether that means endangered species and wildlife, wild areas, uh, people's health, um, and then most, you know, most importantly, and the focus of the last 10 years has been uh, climate. Actually, I, um, I don't know if she's, you said this in your introduction, I've been here before in, uh, at this faculty nine years ago. I came as a Fulbright scholar and taught um, some students in uh, climate law and, and advocacy. And I fell in love with Slovenia and Ljubljana and it's such a, a treat to be back. Uh, this is just a wonderful place. So let me tell you about, like I broke it on the first try. There we go. My organization is named Earth Justice. Uh, we are a, a national NGO. We, we call it nonprofits in America. It means nobody makes any money. Um, and the way that we operate is like we're, we're a law firm. Um, we always represent another entity. And that can be a big, uh, a big environmental NGO like you know, Greenpeace or the Sierra Club or Audubon Society. Or it could be a, a tiny little community group with no staff members and just volunteers. I also represent Indian tribes, which are sovereign governments in, in the states. 
And we sometimes um, even will represent a business. It's pretty, pretty rare, but like the, we've represented the solar industry in utility proceedings. And the model, and these are all you know, my colleagues. Um, uh, as you can see, they're always, you know, we're speaking on someone else's behalf. We're their lawyer, but we're trying to elevate um, and lift their stories. So we don't often put ourselves at the center of the story. We try to put our clients uh, at, at the center of the story. We represent, um, we represent our clients for free. Uh, they don't pay one, one dollar in uh, legal fees. Um, and that's really important because, you know, they don't have, uh, they don't have the money to pay for uh, high quality lawyers most of the time. And we can put in all the time that's needed to do the job right for a case. For example, in the, um, I'll, I'll talk some more about, uh, I represented the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. I have thousands of hours uh, in that case that would, if they had to pay for a law firm, would, would cost millions of dollars. So uh, the way that we make that work is that we rely on donations, mostly from, from individuals. We get about 70 or 80 percent of our income from people that just, they want to be, um, they want to partner with us on environmental protection. And we've been around 50 years. We have a, a pretty good track record of, of success that we can point to. So we, you know, it's not like uh, the Sierra Club or, or, or something where you, you know, you pay $30 and you get a bag and you're a member. We, we kind of go after the people who write um, some bigger checks. Uh, we also get money from foundations. Um, you know, we have a lot of charitable foundations in, in the states that like to support our work. And then we'll talk a little bit more. We, we actually can recover our attorney's fees from the other side when we win some, sometimes. So that's kind of a, a fun too. And one of the, I feel like one of the most exciting and important changes that I've witnessed in my now 25 years uh, doing this kind of work is a shift away from thinking of environmental problems as separate from other kinds of problems. It used to be, you know, there was the environmental people over here, and then there was the people addressing racism over here, and then the people addressing poverty or immigration, all separate and siloed. Now I think there's a greater understanding that, and especially when it comes to the climate crisis, these are all deeply interrelated problems that racism and environmental degradation and, and poverty are all kind of aspects of the same sickness uh, in our society. So we're doing a lot more to work with and elevate these kinds of uh, alternative stories. You know, again, on the, on the Standing Rock case, that case, you know, it was an environmental lawsuit but it really was about telling a story of our terrible history of, of racism and sovereign Indian nations and how poor people and not white people have paid the highest price for industrialization through pollution and environmental degradation. Um, any questions so far? So uh, let, let's get something out of the way uh, early here, which is, which is this. I know that America is a mess, okay? You know that America is a mess. And I sort of wondered, like, if people were coming tonight thinking, why would I listen to this guy? Um, like, their country is not doing so hot, right? Uh, 70 million people voted for this guy, okay, after seeing him run the country for four years. Like, 70 million people. I don't know what to say about them. 
we have our weird thing with guns. Uh, I, I don't, you know, again, I don't know what to tell you about our gun thing. We have these uh, uh, horrible school shootings. They happen all the time. Uh, but we can't seem to figure out our, our thing with guns. We have a terrible uh, poverty uh, problem in Seattle where I live. This, this, is, this is downtown Seattle. That's what a lot of it looks like now. The COVID crisis has really amplified our um, terrible division of wealth. We've got like incredibly wealthy people and incredibly poor people and we're doing a terrible job taking care of them. And you know, our, our infrastructure is, is falling down. So I say that all because if you feel like you need to be polite um, and, and not point out that America is a mess, it's okay. Just, you know, come <laughs> trash talk my country and I'm like, I'm right there with you. Uh, I won't have uh, bad feelings. So America is a mess and there are also some pretty interesting things going on that uh, are kind of cool and that I'm, I'm actually feel pretty good about. Um, one is, and I'm, I'm not telling you anything you, you don't know, uh, we're, we're an incredibly diverse country. Uh, it's, it's a big place, uh, I think 380 million people. Um, people from every walk of life, so many different kinds of cultures and traditions are embodied uh, uh, in, in the states. Um, we have, you know, in one school district, Houston School District, there are 145 different languages spoken. Um, that obviously creates challenges, but it's, where else in the world are you getting uh, this kind of uh, a great mix? And we have, um, you know, while we have a sort of, I think culturally, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, a kind of lack of trust in government, like I, th I think culturally Americans don't rely on the government to solve all their problems. We do have a pretty good history of engaging uh, in solving our problems, uh, that people have a lot of avenues for expressing their views, for participating in governance, um, and as, you know, as we'll talk about, uh, uh, you know, I want to focus on the, on the legal side of this. Um, so what I want to talk for a little bit uh, is, is about the citizen's role in environmental protection, um, specifically using the courts and legal, you know, other kinds of legal advocacy, you know, for example, administrative uh, advocacy. Um, I think there are, I feel like this is a, a bedrock feature of American democracy. I think this is a critical part of our, uh, of our culture. And uh, I want to spend a few minutes um, talking about that. And then if you're thinking, well, why, why do I care about that? Uh, I think the idea is, let me, let me throw out some ideas of things that have worked and you can think about whether you want to, you know, import those ideas or whether, you know, maybe they're already here and you can take advantage of them more. Um, so a little, a little bit of history, uh, it may be helpful. So um, American politics, as you probably know, is profoundly broken. You can't pass laws in America anymore, like they, you know, Congress doesn't work. But that wasn't always the case. Um, in the uh, early 1970s, I, I, I sort of say there was this sort of brief spasm <laughs> of, of rationality where, where things sort of worked a little bit. And this was a, a, around the time of the first Earth Day and a growing awareness of environmental problems and we passed this, this uh, broad range of environmental law at the, at the federal level. And you know, we had um, environmental laws before then, but it was clear that they weren't working, that they, um, 
put all the power in government agencies to do the work, and they created no role for citizens uh, to, to play a watchdog role or, or to provide any accountability. So there was a recognition that um, to, in order to make these new laws effective at environmental protection, we had to give citizens a bigger role. And you know, I think at the time, this sort of felt like an experiment. This was, this was new uh, in, in our, our legal system. Um, and you know, it was controversial. People were worried, though, you know, we'll clog up the courts and we'll shut down industry. So there, you know, there are limits around it. But um, you know, as, as I want to talk about, I think the experiment worked, that, that our democracy is stronger and the environment is cleaner because of the way these laws built in a role uh, for, for citizens. So I think the first, the first point of emphasis is, is fostering the rule of law. Um, and, and, and what does that mean? It, it means you know, sort of building, building a culture where people use the legal system as opposed to avenues outside the legal system, which can, can be you know, messy or problematic, that people can solve problems through the legal system. So you know, Congress passed these laws for cleaner air, cleaner water, for wildlife, for, for wilderness. Uh, um, you know, they're, they're, they're not perfect laws by, by any mean. They, they, they provide some balancing of different kinds of interests. But, but they're pretty good laws with pretty good intentions to, to reduce pollution. So, you know, what we're talking about is not, not changing the laws at the political level, but just making sure that they're implemented correctly. You know, Congress passed the laws. If, if we want to get together and change them, okay, we can do that. But until that happens, Let's implement them uh, as is intended. So when, when citizens play a role in enforcing the standards, they're simply you know, doing what, what the legislature intended by setting these standards. Um, and uh, maybe that seems like just duh, like, you know, like obvious, right? But, but it's actually not. Like not every country has this. Um, Places where you have good environmental standards, but they can be ignored by uh, the government, and nobody can do anything about it. Like you can't take them to court. And, and like, so then, what does it mean? Uh, so when you see, you know, when that happens, when when people say, okay, we have this law, and it's being ignored, and nobody can do anything about it, what I've seen is there's. There's two results. Either people just say, ah, how will that, <laughs> you know, they just become apathetic, right? Like nothing can be done. The government is, you know, and they go live their lives and just ignore the problem. The other way people deal with it is by like breaking windows, <laughs> you know, uh, breaking things because the, the legal system isn't working and they're frustrated and angry. And so they start breaking stuff. Um, you know, in, in this system, you can go out as just an everyday citizen and you can just walk up to the pipe where the factory is discharging pollution. You can take a sample, you know, get it tested, and if they're violating their permit, you can sue them, you know, and the results being cleaner water. So I think that's pretty good. Uh, the, second, the second thing I want to mention is citizen engagement improves the government's accountability. So I'm sure you've experienced this, that agencies uh, uh, or ministries um, have all sorts of reasons why they don't uh, fully enforce the law. You know, going after polluters is controversial, they always say, oh, you're gonna put us out of business or people get unemployed. Um, and of course, you know, depending on who's in power, maybe they don't really care about enforcing environmental laws. So when we come in as citizens, 
it kind of changes the conversation um, that, you know, when we take the, the, the reins of enforcement, um, we, kind of have, we kind of embarrass the agencies to do their jobs. Now, of course, sometimes we're suing the agencies themselves, but a lot of times we're giving them political cover to do things that, that are difficult. Um, and it, prov they, it provides a voice, you know, citizens have a stake in this too, right? It's not just about, oh, the factory is going to have to spend so much money on pollution controls. You know, this is an avenue to say, well, well wait a second, you know, my kids swim in this river or, you know, I like to fish in this river and you're destroying it. And it, I think it helps change the conversation. Um, Another obvious, uh, another obvious reason is they actually are pretty good at improving the environment and protecting the environment. I'll give you an example. Um, one of my friends is a, uh, he's not an NGO lawyer, he's a private lawyer. And all he does is these citi uh, pollution citizen suits under the Clean Water Act. And they go out and they measure the pollution. They look at the permit. Okay, the permit says this. The, the readout says that. And they sue them. <laughs> and uh, over the years he's been doing this, he's done maybe a thousand of these cases. 80% is his guess. 80% have resulted in stopping the pollution and mitigation to clean up the, the harm that they caused. So that's one guy. Um, just, you know, do, doing, his, doing his thing. And we got a lot of folks like that, uh, the, doing that model um, in, in the States. And then I guess the last example is that these, the citizen suits have been really important in advancing the law. You know, we have a common law system um, and the statute is written, but its real meaning gets fleshed out over time in court cases. And I, I, again, I'll give an example. Um, during the Bush administration, uh, second George Bush, he hated the environmental stuff, right? Like, he, he terrible guy. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm very opinionated. I'm not sorry. Uh, so one of the things that they did when they were implementing the Endangered Species Act for salmon, you know, where I live in Seattle, you know, we still have wild salmon, but a lot of them are, are endangered because of pollution and uh, habitat loss and things like that. And the Bush administration put out a new rule that says, okay, how do, is to figure out whether a species qualifies as endangered. And in the new rule, you looked at just the number, the total number of salmon. Didn't matter where they came from. And so, you know, uh, we had hatchery salmon, right? Like a, a farm, farm type salmon, as well as wild salmon. So under this rule, you could count all those fish. And then it doesn't, doesn't look endangered anymore. Okay, this is, like, this is crazy, right? Uh, well, we brought a case against the Bush administration uh, challenging this interpretation of the law, and we won, and, you know, the law says, no, you can't count the, the hatchery fish when you're trying to decide. So, you know, this, this was kind of fun. Um, all right. So I'll just say a few a few words about this and then you know we can talk more with questions if you want um, so these are just some of the key uh, environmental statutes federal environmental statutes that again they, they were all passed in like 1969 to 1972 um, and every couple of years the um, the Republicans, like, I'm sorry to be so bold, you know, blatantly political, but it's just reality. Uh, every couple of years, the Republicans try to come for these laws. 
and, and weaken them, even when they you know, control Congress. And, and, and we almost always fight them back and, and win. Like these laws are still sacrosanct after, after 50 years. And, and why is that? Because people like clean air and clean water. Like this isn't very hard, like at a, at a fundamental level. People care about these things. So we've been successful in protecting all these laws at the legislative um, uh, level. Now, a lot of the work goes on at the agency level. Again, I guess it's, it would be ministries here. So, for example, the Clean Water Act says, okay, the EPA should set a, a, a particular you know, levels of air pollution that protect human health and safety. Like the law is, is, is general like that. And then it's on EPA to go out and it goes through a, a formal administrative rulemaking process to really put that into action. Like what are the specific levels of pollution that uh, uh, are acceptable. And, and, and those provide opportunities to participate. You know, citizens can engage in um, uh, these rulemaking processes. And, uh, you know, we can, we can sue over them if uh, the result is, is problematic. Um, and people, you know, people are pretty engaged. So uh, the national the National Environmental Policy Act is our, uh, is our environmental review law, right? That's what requires environmental impact statements. It's a key law for us to disclose uh, the, the impacts. Well, the rules for, and, you know, and, and the statute is, is this long. <laughs> it, 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 it just says, you know, we want to live in productive harmony with nature and, um, agencies should do environmental impact statements for significant actions. Like that's the whole statute. And then the agency that implements that statute has very detailed rules. And those rules have been in place since 1978. Well, guess who didn't like them? <laughs> Our friend Donald Trump. And uh, last year, Donald Trump uh, uh, proposed a complete rewrite of the uh, of the regs, it just again, just like crazy stuff, making it so difficult for people to participate, um, putting all these barriers. Like the the whole point of these laws is to bring people in, right, and to engage the public and to hear their concerns. Well, his rules were all about keeping the public out, making it smoother, and they didn't try to hide that. They you know they said the goal is let's go let's go build some stuff, um, all this process is getting in the way. Um, and so, you know, we, we've engaged with all our partners on this, and I think we had a million public comments uh, to the agency opposing this thing. And that slowed them down for a while, <laughs> and we brought a lawsuit against uh, the rules which is now underway, but the Biden administration has already reversed course. Like they see, okay, a million people care about this. They're, they're gonna go back and, and fix it. Um, okay. Now we also have, you know, we have our federal system where there's sort of this overarching federal government and then a lot is left to state, uh, uh, state governments. And so in many of these federal laws, there's a very big role um, for the states to implement them. So for example, you know, under the Clean Water Act, uh, states are supposed to set water quality standards and designate what, what kinds of levels of protection are appropriate for different kinds of waters. And you will not be surprised to hear that there's a pretty big difference in how states implement this. You know, you got states like California, uh, Massachusetts, New York, uh, which have strong ethic of environmental protection. 
doing one thing, and then you have other places, yeah, <laughs> that don't have such a strong uh, history. But the idea is that the federal, the federal standards set a floor. You can't go below the floor, but you can always go higher. So, yeah, guess what? The water, is, the water and the air are cleaner in some places than others. Okay. I'm going to keep talking unless I see a hand with a question. So I want to talk a little bit. Uh, I, I don't want to put any non-lawyers to sleep, so I'll be very quick about this part. But I know there's a, a couple students here. How, how does it work that we have access to the courts to enforce laws? Well, uh, there's a couple ways. There, it's, it's directly written in, um, uh, directly in the statute. I probably shouldn't have chosen the blue background. It doesn't look so good. So in some of the um, key environmental statutes, there are provisions that say right there that any person can bring a federal court lawsuit against any other person who is violating the terms of the statute. And so that any person really means anyone. Uh, in fact, we've learned, I, I've been calling them citizen enforcement. Now citizen is a little bit of a loaded word in America because uh, we have plenty of people who aren't American citizens who live and work and pay taxes and contribute to our society. And they can, <laughs> they can bring lawsuits too. So I, we need to change our language to take out that um, citizen uh, idea. Uh, so any, a, a, any person with an interest can bring a lawsuit against any other person. So this is the only place in, in American life where you know just a guy in the street um, or uh, a, a little NGO, a little community volunteer group, has, has the same status as Exxon or as the United States government. You know, a guy in the street can sue the United States government in federal court and have full access to the remedial powers of, of federal court. We also have a law called the Administrative Procedures Act which is sort of a catch-all um, that uh, allows any person to challenge any final government decision uh, on the basis that it wasn't within statutory authority, on the basis that the rules, the pr procedures weren't followed, uh, or on the basis that it was just dumb. You know, there's, it, it's not such an easy case to win, but the, the language in the American system is arbitrary and capricious that government action has to be rational. They have to explain why they're doing that. And sometimes it's very hard for them to do it because what they're doing isn't so rational. So it's not, it's still a procedural kind of review, and, but the procedure is, did the government think about all of the issues at stake and did it explain its decision in a rational way? And it's not, a, it's not a very high standard to get over. Like all they got, all they got to do is like really explain why they're doing what they're doing. But we win under that standard all the time. All right, let me talk a little bit about standing because this is important and again, for, for the non-lawyers, uh, well, the law students should know what standing is, uh, right? You, to have a, a, you have to have a personal stake in um, the, the issue before the court in order for a court to have um, a jurisdiction. And, citizens, and standing is a big issue every, everywhere that I, you know, in other countries. In some places, it is a complete barrier to um, citizen involvement. And um, uh, in the states, I think we have a little bit uh, more um, liberal 
rule. So the concept of standing comes from the United States Constitution, which says that federal courts have jurisdiction over cases and controversies. And the courts have interpreted that to mean there has to be a real controversy. So if, if you are polluting on her property, I can't come in and bring a case about that because it's like, what does it have to do with me? Uh, it's between the two of you, right? So that's sort of the, the concept of standing. And um, in order to have standing in the American system, you have to show three things. That you, uh, that you are injured, you have been injured by the illegal action that you're complaining of, that uh, your injury was caused by whatever the illegal action was, and that your injury will be um, redressed, that it will be fixed if the court intervenes and, and gives you uh, what you want. And what I think is a little bit unique in our system is that the concept of injury, you might think, okay, how, how am I injured by this, this thing? Well, some of the obvious ones are if you're a property owner and the pollution is reducing the value of your property. Or if you're one of those people that breathes air. Um, <laughs> that's a little subset. Um, uh, and you can show that the that pollution is harming your health. So th those are the kinds of ways we can show standing, but it goes further. The American courts have recognized an aesthetic uh, injury, that if you like to, you know, look at salmon or, or orcas and you feel like good feelings in your heart and you, you know, write poetry uh, or you take pictures, um, and someone is doing something to injure that species, well, that's good enough. That's good enough um, to, to uh, get citizens standing in, in the American system. Um, okay, let me talk about the fun stuff. Costs. So you, you might be thinking, okay, how, how does all this get paid for? Um, well, first, in the American system, for better or for worse, is uh, different than, than most European systems, where if a plaintiff brings a case and loses, we don't have to pay the attorney's fees for the other side. It's very common in, um, in countries around the world that if you bring a case and you lose, you're stuck with a bill. And this is a huge barrier to citizen participation because who, who can afford to pay Exxon's lawyers or to pay the government's lawyers? Like I, I, I bet Exxon lawyers for a big law firm charge a thousand dollars per hour and they'll have, you know, they'll, they'll do thousands of hours on anything you do. So we don't have the risk, like I think uh, you do here in Slovenia, where you could get stuck with a bill. And this is a huge, huge difference. And if you were going to fix one thing, like this, this would be a good one to fix. But it gets a little better in that uh, it, it works the opposite if you win. So if we are successful in a federal citizen suit, we can make the other side pay our attorney, you know, pay for me um, at market rates. Uh, so, you know, I go around and look what a, a big law firm charges for an attorney with 25 years, which is like way, way more than you want to know. Um, and I can send them the bill. Um, you know, I was talking about my, my friend who did all these citizen suits a moment ago. He never charges his clients any money. Every case he does is for free. And he knows that he's going to win enough of the time that he'll make a, a nice living. You know, he's not getting rich like some, you know, fat cat uh, uh, corporate lawyer. But, you know, he's pretty good at it. And he knows he's going to win most of the time. 
And so there's a lot of people out there, private attorneys, doing this kind of model to do environmental protection cases. And I think that's, it's, it's I don't know if it's unique, um, but um, it, it enables us to do a lot more uh, work than we otherwise would. In, in our, in my organization, um, which is, I, I can't remember if I said, is a big organization, 500 employees, 180 lawyers. Um, this is a pretty small uh, part of our income, maybe seven or eight percent, because there's a lot of cases that don't qualify for this, but it's still, it's still a good chunk of money. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about some, um, I think we'll, we'll, do one, we'll do one case study uh, on, on the coal terminals. And I, I just kind of want to share with you a little bit about the way that I think about and approach these kinds of cases. And, you know, a lot of times with lawsuits, we think about, well, did you win or did you lose? Like, it's just binary. It's, it's one, of, one of the two things, right? And I want to think about lawsuits in a little bit different way. It, and how do you use uh, a lawsuit in connection with other kinds of advocacy to build power? You know, I, I used to think that if you just had the best arguments, and the, the best, you know, PowerPoint, and, and, you know, you could go in and explain to anybody, this is how it should be, and they'd be like, of course, your arguments are so good, and your PowerPoint is so detailed, uh, you know, we'll, we'll go with you. And of course, that's not the way it works. Um, it, it, it's, about, it's about building power. And, and, and one of the things I want to emphasize, um, and if you don't remember anything else, I, th I think this is the, the piece that I'd want you to remember, is that litigation, uh, legal advocacy, never exists in a vacuum on its own. You're not gonna solve any big problem with lawsuits alone. They have to be tethered to other kinds of advocacy, grassroots, communications, political, power building. Um, they, you know, they, they, they're a great tool, like this is my life's work. They can be a great tool at raising awareness, at building attention. It's really important when a neutral uh, third party, a judge, validates what you've been saying. So you stand out there yelling from the rooftops about you know, this problem and nobody will listen to you. Well, when a federal judge agrees with you, that's very powerful. But on its own, it's, it's, you know, it's rarely enough. If you bring a lawsuit and win without those other pieces, I think it can be, it's not a durable victory. Um, and so these are some of the, uh, the principles. You know, I was trying to think about how to approach the climate. Um, you know, how, how do we litigate in the context of the climate crisis when there's just, it's so overwhelming, right? Like there's so many things happening everywhere. How do you begin thinking about crafting a lawsuit to help advance um, solutions to the, to the climate crisis? So these are the things I came up with. I don't, you know, I don't know if they're good or not, um, but I'll, 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 I'll share them with you. One is to focus on infrastructure. Uh, and, and the reason for that is that, you know, when someone is building a pipeline, crude oil pipeline, or a, a LNG terminal, or a, a coal export uh, facility, that thing costs hundreds of millions of dollars, sometimes billions of dollars, of private money. It's going to be there for a long time, okay? Like if somebody spends a billion dollars on a pipeline, it is gonna be very hard to get that thing pulled out of the ground. So we have a ton of work to do in addressing the climate crisis, but uh, making things worse with new huge investments in infrastructure is like the worst possible thing you can do. 
And I see now that like there's all these people calling for more gas exports, LNG exports from the states in light of the crisis here in Europe. And it's, it's oh, like it's terrible because that stuff's going to be there for 50 years. Um, focus on the economics. Like even if you can't stop things, can you shift the economics so that fossil fuels become more expensive? And that's not quite the right um, word I want. I want fossil fuels, the price of fossil fuels, to reflect the harm they impose on society. You know, so there's all this stuff like from, from you know, air pollution to water pollution to toxic waste to you know, greenhouse gases that's happening, but it's not reflected in the price of, of a fossil fuel. So can you internalize some of that cost in the price in a way that makes it, you know, all of a sudden the renewables become uh, cost competitive? So, for example, you know, if I, can, if I can't stop a coal-fired power plant, but I can make them gold-plated with the most expensive pollution control technology possible, a lot of times we've seen they, the economics don't work anymore and they fall apart. Uh, a third principle is I always try to think about how to use these cases to diminish the social license of this industry. You know, people still, you know, this is changing, but people see these companies as, as just, you know, people in society, or they, have, they have lots of jobs. And, you know, when I go fight a, a refinery in a community, they're sponsoring the, the kids' baseball team and stuff like that. And, um, you know, they give out little coats with the Shell logo and shit like that. Um, no, <laughs> they can't get away with that anymore. Uh, I, we need to use litigation and other kinds of uh, advocacy to spotlight the harm they're causing. And one of the ways that we do that is by elevating stories, people's stories. Like how have people been hurt by uh, this, this facility, whether it's you know, Native Americans at risk from uh, spill or local fishermen who are leaving the industry because, you know, even though they're the fourth generation fishermen, there's, there's no more fish because of the pollution. So we elevate these stories and we link them to the companies to undermine their political power in, in our society. And I think the last and most important piece is every case is an opportunity to build and diversify a movement. Um, if we are going to really, you know, tackle the climate crisis and, and do the cultural and economic shift that is required, we need, we need every partner we can engage in that. That can't be like just a bunch of environmentalists, okay? We need to bring in all kinds of, uh, of, of people. So I want to give you an example of, of a case that I worked on um, for like 10 years. Well, it was actually a lot of cases um, that I think illustrates these, these principles. All right. All right, so I want to talk about um, the fight against coal terminals in the Pacific Northwest. So uh, this, this dials back all the way to about uh, 2010. And one day I was sitting at my desk, and it was kind of funny. I had just finished a two-week trial in a Clean Water Act case. And I was, you know, I was very tired. And I literally had my feet up on my desk thinking, what should I work on now? Because <laughs> uh, my case was over, and we won, and, and it was great. But I, I was literally just, hmm, what would I like to work on today? Um, and this call comes in that like, hey, this company wants to build a coal export terminal on the Columbia River, which is the, the biggest uh, river in the, in the Northwest. Uh, and they want to take Wyoming coal and ship it to China. Do you think you want to help? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I think I want that. Um, so what had happened is around that time, uh, the markets had shifted 
Well, a, a, couple things, a couple things were happening. One is that the U.S. was burning less and less coal, uh, which, is, which is pretty common around the, in the, around the world. Coal, I mean, coal really sucks. Uh, it's just garbage fuel. And we were, we were burning less of it. Unfortunately, a lot of it was being replaced with, with gas. Um, but we have a lot of coal in the states, like the, in the Powder River Basin in Montana, it's a 20 foot thick uh, seam of pure coal, uh, and they just, it's just they pulled out of the ground. So we're using less coal, we have a lot of it, and then China, uh, its growth, and at that time it was building uh, a lot of coal. China went from being a net exporter to a net importer. And all of a sudden there was an opportunity to sell all this Montana and Wyoming coal to China. Um, oh yeah, here we go. Here's the uh, Powder River Basin. Um, very, uh, very empty part of, of the country uh, and, and very conservative states. But um, through the aid of sophisticated technology and GIS tools, we were able to confirm that Montana is actually very far from China. Uh, <laughs> and, and that the only way to do it was to ship it through uh, Washington and Oregon, uh, which is where we were which is a very progressive uh, uh, part of the country. And within this really short um, uh, amount of, uh, of time, there was, there was uh, six or seven major terminals that were being discussed uh, for, for our region. And these are huge, uh, uh, huge projects, 50 million tons uh, of, of coal a year. Um, so, and I remember my boss, who has argued many cases to the Supreme Court and is like a very nationally respected lawyer, she said, you, you can't stop these people. You know that, right? Like, there is no way you can fight all these things. Like, we just don't have the tools uh, 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 to do it. But we set about um, trying to think um, strategically, like, okay, who, who is the decider? Who is the person that decides whether this project gets built or not? These aren't national um, projects. There wasn't much national permitting. It was mostly state and local permitting. And in some places, in communities that were pretty hostile to environmentalists, this one uh, Longview, that was the, the main one we'll talk about. Longview is a very uh, depressed town. It used to be a timber industry town, and the timber industry kind of really slowed down because of environmentalists, uh, and so they don't like us so much down in Longview. And so, okay, who's going to decide? Well, the, the city of Longview was one, one person that was going to decide. Another person that could decide was the company themselves. They could decide not to do it. And how do you do that? By making it so unbelievably painful to proceed that they give up. Um, who doesn't, uh, one person who is not a decider is a judge. The judge does not decide whether it's a good idea to export coal or they don't get to decide whether on balance we should have a coal export terminal or not. The judge will decide if the procedures have been followed and that's it. They don't get to have an opinion about uh, uh, the wisdom of the thing. So, you know, we, although we could bring lawsuits, we had to focus on these other decision makers because you can, you know, you can win, but it's just a, a, procedural, a procedural kind of win. Um, so the first step, and I'll talk about this one in, in Longview because that lasted the longest. Um, oh, there I have a smart slide. Um, 
this Millennium Coal Terminal uh, in Washington. This was the first one my friend called me about. And actually, um, it was just initially proposed to be a pretty tiny project, five million tons of coal a year, which isn't actually that, that much. It's maybe one, uh, the trains, the coal trains that come in are about a mile and a half long. It's only like one train a day. And of course, the county said, oh, this project is too small to need a full environmental review, right? It's just this little project. And it's gonna clean up this old uh, crappy place they have up there. This is gonna be great. And hire, hire people in the community. So they got their permit like within weeks, okay? This was all moving so fast. They were ready to start construction. Well, we brought a lawsuit over um, environmental review, saying you need to do a, the impacts are bigger, and you need to do a full uh, environmental review. And this was kind of fun. So once you, once you, you know, initiate the lawsuit, you have access through discovery to all their files. Well, I found out, you know, so they do the usual thing, they sent hundreds of thousands of, of pages. <laughs> And they thought I wasn't going to read it, but I have no life. Um, <laughs> and I did read it. Uh, and I discovered that they were lying. That it wasn't a 5 million ton project, it was a 50 million ton project. And they were keeping that quiet until they got all their permits and they got it initially built. And then they would announce their expansion plans. <laughs> Well, I took all this stuff in an envelope and I, uh, I got it to my friend at the New York Times and they did a big story and the CEO of the company uh, retired to spend more time with his family uh, and they withdrew the project and they said, okay, okay, we'll do the full environmental review. Well, this was, this was critical because it gave us time to build that political coalition against uh, uh, the project, which, you know, it didn't exist. Um, so again, you know, thinking about our goals, about like diminishing social license, this was very effective at undermining the social license of this company. The local officials did not like being lied to. So we put them in the hole uh, uh, right out the gate with this one. Um, All right. So this, this gave us an opportunity, uh, this, this full environmental reviewing process gave us, gave us an opportunity to have more time to focus on, uh, you know, what are, what are the impacts of this? And the thing that we, um, we tried to do that I think worked really well is we really tried to connect it to people's values that it wasn't just all about facts and figures. Like, people don't respond that well to, like, data. They respond to values. And the message that we really put at the heart of this was, I don't know. Oh, did it <laughs> just do my whole PowerPoint? Wait. Sorry, I gave you a preview of the whole thing. Um, like, this is in West Virginia out here. This, this is Washington. What we care about is, you know, we don't, we, we don't want this in our community. Um, this is an environmentally conscious place. We don't want these coal trains. We don't want to be a coal export hub. Um, and one of, the, you know, one of the things that we did, and I'll give you another example of how legal advocacy matches to grassroots advocacy. You know, I showed you all these, um, all these terminals in the Northwest, right? There was like six of them at the same time. And it, every one of them was just in isolation. Just it was a local, local environmental review, local permit. But we started uh, kind of a, a petition to force the government to do a, a programmatic or regional environmental impact statement. Now, this sounds very um, technical. You know, it's like people aren't going to cheer, you know, what do we want? A programmatic environmental impact <laughs> statement, <laughs> you know. But what it did, it, 
what it did was enable us to shift the conversation away from six little projects with isolated um, impacts into a regional <coughs> conversation around values. And you know, we didn't we didn't get this EIS. We didn't prevail, but we you know went to the editorial boards of local newspapers and we explained the problem. And all of a sudden we're getting editorials from local conservative papers saying, well, we, we think we should have a you know, regional EIS on all these coal terminals. <laughs> and we went to you know, city councils and they passed resolutions saying, yeah, let's, let's step back. There's a, there's a lot at stake here. Um, and in this way, we were kind of able to shift the conversation uh, towards this, this whole question of whether the Pacific Northwest should be a global hub uh, for, for coal export. So, you know, back to my earlier point about, you know, it's not always binary. We didn't get the regional EIS, but we, we did shift the conversation in a really uh, a powerful way. Um, so, you know, we did a lot of storytelling, both in court and out of court about what what all these projects would mean for people in the in the Northwest. I can't seem to get off this button. Um, you know, these trains, as I said, are a mile and a half long. And if all these projects were built out, they would be uh, like I, I don't remember the numbers anymore. Dozens and dozens of these trains every day coming through our and this is the waterfront near Seattle. Um, this turned out to be a weirdly effective way of connecting with people. People really did not like hearing about these trains. And here's, a, here's one, because there, there's a coal terminal in uh, Canada, so we do have a couple of these trains. Well, someone got this nice picture of an ambulance that is being delayed by a mile and a half long train. Okay, we go and talk to the firefighters and the ER medics and the nurses and get them on our side. That's, that's power building, okay? People like doctors and nurses more than environmentalists <laughs> and certainly more than lawyers. Um, so we, you know, we got the, the medical and emergency uh, community uh, on our side. This, this is an actual town in Oregon that these trains would run through. Like, are you kidding me? You're gonna run? A mile and a half long train through that, like there's like drunk guys coming out of the bar, you know, <laughs> falling down. Um, we talked a lot about air pollution, um, and we, you know, with these uh, um, visual images. Um, Uh, this is the terminal in Canada that we got on a windy day. And we, we took this to all the reporters and the editorial writers and the town councils and said, is this, is this really what you want in your community? Um, more air pollution. Talked about safety. I also did uh, a lot of cases around oil trains. And in the case of oil trains, it looks, um, it's a big mushroom cloud. And uh, there was a one terrible case in Canada where it killed dozens of people when the uh, oil train went. But yeah, you go to this guy's house and say, hey, what do you think about this uh, coal proposal? Um, we also talked about how this would affect um, marine traffic, that all of a sudden in our, in our cherished places, like the Columbia River and Puget Sound, there's these uh, huge coal bulkers coming back and forth, you know, running over the windsurfers and the, the fisher uh, men. And, and so we went out to them and brought them onto our side. You know, of course, more coal would mean more mining. And then sort of the, a, a big question is that some people wanted to hear about, some people didn't want to hear about, was, you know, what does this mean for the climate picture? Like, what is our role uh, how, does, how do these um, projects influence this you know, shared goal of, it keeps jumping ahead without my... <laughs> Maybe you press too much? 
Uh, I'm sure it's user error. Uh, so, you know, we built this whole campaign with legal components and, and non-legal components around storytelling. And we would, you know, hire an expert to write a report about how um, opening up Montana coal for Chinese export would set us back, you know, 30 years in decarbonizing. Or we'd hire an expert on how many people would be killed by trains, um, you know, uh, in, in traffic jams, or how long the delays would be. Um, and what we were trying to do, you know, we were always taking the initiative. We we're always throwing something new at them because they have their story too, right? Their story is, oh, jobs and, you know, clean up the site and we'll hire like 12 people and whatnot. Um, you have to crowd out their narrative with your narrative. So we were always throwing new things at them, new reports, new lawsuits, uh, so that all anybody would you'd talk about was our side of the story. And then the EIS process, it gave us a structure. There was, you know, there's hearings, there's comment opportunities, and it, um, it allowed us to get these different, uh, different kinds of voices. Like, here's a guy in a cowboy hat. Not normally on our side, right? But, you know, we went out to some of the farmers in eastern Washington and explained how they weren't going to be able to get, you know, their products on trains anymore because all the trains would be used for coal. And that, you know, we had that studied and, and that, that was true. The rail system was at capacity. So we had guys in cowboy hats. Um, you know, there's someone in a, a priest. Thing. Yeah, that's, that's a good messenger. Um, and we were able to organize. We taught people how to write comments uh, on the EIS. Um, and we, we help people engage, and we had these great, uh, you know, these great hearings, thousands of people, but you'll notice they're, they're all kind of old. Uh, <laughs> older people have spare time, I guess. Um, but, you know, we, we were able through the storytelling to bring all these people into the process, and then of course, you know, we invite and invite the press, um, I want to say one, uh, um, what the hell is that? One of the alliances that was very powerful was with Native American tribes who have special rights under American law. And I think it's something that as environmentalists we treat with a lot of delicacy. There's a, there's a bad history of environmentalists showing up uh, only when they want something. Uh, and we don't want to do that anymore. But these projects really threatened them as well, and they're, they're powerful storytellers. These are uh, my, my friends up at the Lumi tribe, um, and they're, they're burning, the, the company offered them millions and millions of dollars, and these are, these are some pretty poor people, and they're symbolically burning the check that they were offered to show their uh, complete opposition to the project. Um, so, what happened, <laughs> here's the punchline. So what happened was thanks to this advocacy, lead, strong legal advocacy and grassroots advocacy, we got this EIS that I think was the best EIS, uh, environmental impact study, ever written. <laughs> uh, they looked at every aspect of the traffic, the health, the, the climate impacts, the, the marine transportation. And, and I've only seen this happen a few times. The, the permitting agency took the CIS and said, no, uh, we don't want this project. The impacts are too severe. They didn't have to say that. You know, once you do a good enough job on your EIS, the government can do what it wants. And then it's, it's politically accountable, but we can't bring a lawsuit over that. But, the, uh, uh, the government said, no, we're going to deny you the permits. Uh, that was the one in Longview here at Lummi. The federal government said that it would be a violation of the treaty with the Lummi to allow the project, and they killed, they killed that project. That's where it would have been. This is Mount Baker. Um, 
in the northwest corner of the states, the uh, project would have been right, right there. And so the punchline is that uh, six of the projects were proposed, zero were ever built. They're all gone. The, this one, we were in lawsuits with them for five years. They were challenging the, the permit denial under every theory you could think of under the sun. It violated the Constitution and, you know, the Ten Commandments or whatever they could think of. Uh, but we won all those lawsuits because, you know, we, we stick with it. So, not, you know, not only did we win the issue, we leveraged the fight to build a movement, to build power, and then to create alliances. And now, you know, local NGOs, they know those farmers in eastern Washington, and they know those clergy people uh, on the coast, and the relationships with the tribes are, are stronger. Um, so, uh, I, oh, all right, I'm going to stop this now. <laughs> uh, I think uh, a wild, wildly successful example of citizen advocacy with, with legal power mixed with um, um, grassroots power. So I'll, I'll stop, I mean, the sound of my voice is just so annoying to me. Um, so I'll stop talking and, and I hope you have some questions for me.